Good evening, everyone. Um, happy New Year to all of you. And as usual, thank you again for taking the time out of your busy schedules, particularly at this moment in time, given that many of us are in um, an inpatient healthcare setting and challenged with uh, the current COVID surge. And we'll have more details on that here in a moment. <clears throat> but um, before we get started, just wanted to, again, welcome you all. Um, we've got uh, an agenda laid out um, that was sent to you in advance. Um, some critical updates around work that's being done um, with several of our work groups, and as well as what the Office of Parenting Quality Improvement is, is doing with Omno and um, other activities. Um, we're not gonna go through everyone doing their, their personal introduction, um, but uh, what we'd like for you to do and what we'd ask that you do is in the chat box, enter um, who you are and who you're representing. That way we can document that. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chad Smith. I serve as the Chief Medical Officer at Mercy Hospital, Oklahoma City. I'm also practicing as an OB hospitalist at Mercy Hospital and help with uh, medical directorship for the Oklahoma Perinatal Quality Improvement Collaborative, working with Barbara O'Brien, Denise Cole, Barbara Coop. Elizabeth O'Coop. So um, definitely appreciate you being here with us. Um, with that said, before we get started on um, partner updates, I'm actually going to provide a general um, COVID overview um, for the benefit of the group. As, as I alluded to, um, that's what we're, we're currently being challenged with as a state um, and as a healthcare um, industry across the state. So uh, next slide. So <clears throat> this is data as of um, a few days ago that is statistical analysis um, performed and provided by, uh, I'm sorry, um, De uh, Denise, can you back up one? I apologize. Um, so I wanna, as I, as I go into the next slide, which is a projection of, of COVID and what we anticipate in the Oklahoma City metro area, um, this is based off of analytical, analytical data that's performed at the Mercy system level at our headquarters in St. Louis, but they're looking at um, this particular formula, which takes into account the reproductive number of the virus, how fast it's replicating, also factors such as vaccination rates um, across the state and within the metro area, and other such uh, rules, policies, and regulations that are in place that might help mitigate the spread of, uh, of COVID in our communities. But then furthermore, it takes into account um, watershed events that may or may not contribute to super spreader events. And that's all kind of tabulated into um, a projection. And so if you go to the next slide now, this is that graphic rep representation of what is projected for the Oklahoma City region in terms of the median or mean um, projection, uh, which is that bold red line um, running through the center of the graph. And then you can see the the, the upper limit and the lower limit in that shaded area of the graph. And so this is looking a little bit concerning um, from an overall COVID perspective in that um, we're definitely going to exceed and um, have already started to exceed the last peak that we experienced this past summer. But then when you compare it to the peak that occurred roughly a year ago, we're going to exceed the overall volume if the projections pan out. And I would say the Mercy Analytics team has been fairly um, accurate with their projections, but um, because of the, the nature of Omicron and how difficult it has been to, to predict, um, there's a little bit less confidence as you can see by how broad um, that red shaded area is. But the one good thing to point out, while the peak is going to be higher in terms of overall volume, the, the width of the peak is going to be much more narrow. And so that's also reflective of the disease state of Omicron, which is it's highly infectious, but not as virulent as the Delta surge and the, and the previous surge before us. Um, so that's a little bit of a, of a bright note. In the bottom right, you can see the, the, the most current data from um, the web in terms of what the R value for Omicron is in um, Oklahoma at this time, it's 1.3, which just simply indicates that the virus is spreading more rapidly than people can become infected and clear the virus without spreading it themselves. So this is what uh, Mercy Hospital has been kind of working on from a projection standpoint. 
Um, it does offer a little bit of a bleak uh, future. We're due to hit that, that peak volume in the next week and a half to two weeks, but then by the middle to end of February, um, be through this latest surge. Um, I say Omicron is what we're dealing with. If you look at all the um, available, available data out of the CDC, um, they're showing more and more Omicron is the primary um, variant that's available. If we look at our um, state health department data, it's indicating as such as well, but probably the most indicative of uh, Omicron being the most prevalent um, variant around is the wastewater evaluation. So when we look at wastewater um, analytics, it's showing roughly 90%, 96% of the COVID um, material that's in the wastewater is of the Omicron variant. So Omicron is by far the, the most prevalent and what we're challenged with the most. And so I would say just to highlight, you know, why we're in the same predicament that we've been in the past, um, despite the fact that Omicron causes less severe disease, it's a sheer volume um, issue at this point. So um, many more people are, are contracting um, Omicron and because of just a general increase in the overall volume, the overall denominator, um, that's that much more opportunity for more people to get sick. And so um, that's, that's what we're challenged and struggled, um, struggling with at this point. Plus, you couple that with outside environmental factors. So our, our workforce is, is getting sick. Um, all of the metro hospitals are reporting large numbers of, of coworkers and employees that are out sick with COVID or on some um, level of quarantine due to um, recent COVID infection. Um, also, schools are starting to announce um, not um, having classes. Those sorts of issues are causing workforce related issues as well. So this is a combination of both increase in patient volume increase in, in overall positivity rates, but then also a diminishing workforce because of um, infection with COVID. Denise, if you go to the, the, the next slide. And this is uh, the second to last slide that I have. And, and really what this is representative of is as compared to the um, peaks that we were seeing in um, the, the previous COVID surge a year ago, um, thought largely to be due to Delta you could see the hospitalizations were a little bit higher um, at this point, um, but essentially this kind of just shows and represents the decoupling that we're seeing between overall positivity and the number of hospitalizations, which again just speaks to um, Omicron is highly infectious, but not as virulent as uh, the Delta variant that we experienced the last time around. And so on the top, you see hospitalization and intensive care admissions, and then below you're seeing the overall daily cases over the last 90 days. And then um, next slide, just further reflective of the fact uh, that this uh, Omicron variant is, is less severe overall, um, which is also beneficial. And um, according to many pundits that um, are experts around this field, um, they, the growing consensus is that perhaps Omicron is the next step to becoming an endemic state where it's almost like the flu. And in fact, the um, the last statistics that I looked at comparing deaths from Omicron variant indicate that um, the overall number of deaths due to Omicron are less than what we would see with a typical um, flu season. So kind of further indicating that this might be coming in an endemic state. And after that, it's hard to determine if this is a, a twice a year or a yearly um, type of um, endemic state that we, that we'll, that we'll deal with. Um, that being said, the, uh, you know, the biggest things that uh, the CMOs across the metro continue to, to want to promote is vaccination. If you've had the primary series, that's good, but not as good as having the primary series and the booster of Pfizer or Moderna. If you've had the primary series and the booster of Pfizer in particular, um, you're, you're looking at an efficacy of roughly 88% in reducing severe infection and need for hospitalization. The reason why this is so important that, we're, that we continue to promote vaccination is that outside of that, we really are limited in what we can do um, in terms of providing health care for these patients. There are some monoclonal antibodies. The monoclonal antibodies that we were using prior to Omicron are actually no longer um, as beneficial, so we stopped using them. Um, the very few um, monoclonal antibodies that we do have, one is citrovimab. Um, it's highly um, allocated and is therefore fairly scarce in terms of the overall volume of that drug that we have. And so demand far, out, um, far exceeds the current supply. Um, Paxlovid is the Pfizer oral medication that's recently come out. Um, that's starting to get circulated into the community. 
it's a protease inhibitor. Um, but also there's, there's not quite near enough of that to meet the demands of all the people that are positive for, for Omicron and maybe high risk and may benefit from taking something like that to avoid um, hospitalization or severe infection. So um, our primary mitigation um, ability is still and always will be with vaccine at this point. So um, we continue to encourage that, obviously social distancing um, when it's appropriate and wearing masks when you're out in public. Um, would all be continued to be advisable under the, the current situation while we're, we're dealing with the surge. So I'm um, happy, happy to answer any questions, but that's kind of a general uh, rundown of, of the current state of the state in terms of COVID. Um, we have a, a couple more rough weeks ahead of us, and hopefully we can get through that pretty quickly and start to come down um, and recover from this, this most recent surge. So if there are no questions, then we'll just jump straight into our agenda and we will open up to our partner updates. So Dr. Stanley, I have you next on the, on the list if uh, you're ready. I think Joyce was going to do most of the talking. Is that right, okay. Joyce? That's, that's fine. Help me, help me out here. <laughs> you add in as we go. Add your great commentary. <laughs> All right, well, with the Maternal Health Task Force, um, been making progress despite everything going on with COVID, still made a lot of progress in the last while. Um, first of all, with the work groups, um, the access to care work group is um, addressing those access to care issues throughout the state. Yes, there is a map that shows the specific items that each work group is working on. Um, specifically, um, recently they have been looking at local working with primary care groups and also addressing and looking at baby scripts and how that might be a program that can be utilized web-based app to assist in efforts, especially, especially with telehealth and home visits. Uh, additionally, yeah, the Innovative Information Technology and Data System work group, um, one of the main items uh, that's been done in that work group recently is the Oklahoma Maternal Health Data Catalog. So that data catalog kind of catalogs um, Oklahoma maternal health data and how and where it is available and who to contact for more information, what measures are available. And right now they are working on turning that from an ex basically Excel tables that are available with links to accept, access the data to a web-based application that can be published on websites and utilized um, throughout by the task force and the perinatal quality improvement collaborative, along with the public as needed. Um, also the behavioral health and social support work group um, has been doing a lot of work um, with making things more accessible um, and available to LGBTQ plus and other hard to reach um, communities. Uh, also for substance use treatment and looking at both of those for incarcerated individuals and making services accessible to them. Um, health equity, the work group has uh, the main item recently in that regard is the Speak Up Health Disparities e-training that is available. And that is available for anyone who is um, in, involved in maternal health care. Um, you can reach out through OPQIC and also the health department um, to sign up if you, need your, if you would like any of your staff to have that training. And um, CME and CNE. And CEU credits are all available um, and can be provided for that training. So that is accessible at this time. Also some additional items, the STAR clinic continues um, to receive accolades and make um, great progress with the comprehensive specialized prenatal care for women with substance use disorders and pregnancy. They are looking um, to expand services uh, through telehealth um, utilizing county health departments and also through other areas. Uh, they reached uh, 56 women actually delivered that were part of that clinic this year. So that is um, outstanding. And I know Dr. Pierce may have more to say in that regard. 
Uh, she kind of leads that program uh, for the state. Uh, also, the Cherokee Nation uh, initiated maternal fetal medicine services this last quarter with the assistance from the Perinatal Center. Uh, Telemedicine Project ECHO continues for high-risk OB. Um, they had uh, 11 important sessions and case studies this year with a total of 193 participants involved over the same period. Um, also, a contract's been finalized for, with the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board to assist in promoting uh, prenatal care and maternal health and identifying gaps in services for the tribes in our state. Um, also, the OSDH uh, maternal uh, maternity clinics for county health departments and mobile units is set to begin in the first week of February for two of our pilot regions, districts seven and nine, which is kind of the east central and southeast part of the state. And that is for prenatal care. Uh, maternal, let's see, uh, working with CDC on the pregnancy module continues 2020. A data is about to be wrapped up and reported on. We'll be providing more in that regard soon that should give us more details in relation to both Oklahoma and the nation as far as outcomes and um, effects of COVID-19 among pregnant women. Uh, chest mobile health. Uh, is promoting e-referral processes for pregnant women with substance use disorders for treatment. And that has now been expanded access to all maternal and child health programs um, at the state. Uh, it's also being offered in hospitals uh, through our partners with OPQIC, uh, maternal uh, mental health and substance abuse services, and the OSDH Injury Prevention Service. And so that application is, I know been talked about before, but it's basically the e-referral system um, to treatment for uh, pregnant women. Finally, I um, just wanted to say that um, the OPQIC, uh, along with the OPQIC, those birth warning signs are being distributed, continue to be distributed in birthing hospitals. The Maternal Morbidity Support Program has been meeting with its eight peer navigators and they've been presenting both locally and nationally regularly. And Team Bird um, continues to uh, make progress. Um, they will be launching with cohort one, launching with the patients in the next couple months uh, with cohort one and cohort two is in recruitment for the spring and several have already signed up. Uh, for a cohort too. So we're really looking forward to that delivery process initiative um, to further improve outcomes throughout the state. And I think I um, also want to announce that um, I'll be putting links to the Oklahoma Maternal Health Task Force website um, link through the health department along with to new reports that have been published in relation to the Maternal Health Task Force strategic plan profile, and also the um, Maternal Health and MMRC, uh, Maternal Morbidity and Mortality, first and second annual reports um, that have both been, have been published to the site and are available um, providing both the situation of maternal health in our state and recommendations and moving forward. And Dr. Stanley, did you have anything to add in that regard? I think that's just a little bit of what we have going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so quite a bit out there and, and making strides as much as we can right now. So great, great job keeping up with all of it. Yes, thank you. Joyce, are you, is that all for you, Joyce? I, I think that is all. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Joyce or, and Dr. Stanley?
All okay. right. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to Trailer Reigns, who will provide some OHCA updates. Hi, right, good evening, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> a few things to talk about today. The general public health emergency update and as it, uh, its impacts on Sooner Care. Uh, currently, we're kind of uh, getting hints around the PHE being extended probably through the end of June. Um, we've been told up until now it would be through the end of March and that we should start talking about unwinding and what that looks like, but more and more signs are pointing to the end of June. Uh, just as a reminder, during the public health emergency, we can't remove anyone from Sooner Care enrollment, uh, even if their income exceeds uh, our current limits or other eligibility factors aren't met. So right now we have like around 160,000 individuals that are on Sooner Care that uh, do not technically meet eligibility requirements that are uh, still able to maintain their eligibility. So when it does come time, though, we are working through what our uh, unwinding plan will be and how we will uh, kind of categorize individuals based on need. A um, couple of scenarios, if the Build Back Better plan does pass, um, CMS will give us 12 months in which to do the unwinding piece so that we could, uh, you know, roll folks off of enrollment based on hierarchy of need rather than do a mass unenrollment. So we have a team dedicated to looking at that. We're actually meeting with other Medicaid directors throughout the US uh, next month to talk about this um, and see how other states are, are thinking through this as well. Um, next, we kind of give an overview of where we're at with managed care. <clears throat> we Met with the governor's office a couple of weeks ago to talk about what our options are moving forward. Uh, you know, previously, of course, we had looked at the third party managed care model. Um, legislative leadership has pretty much indicated that they will not support a third party managed care model. And so we're looking at uh, other states and accountable care organization models, more provider led entities. Um, and so right now, that's kind of the path we're exploring. We don't have an estimated time frame for any kind of implementation yet. Uh, based on other state experience though, if we were to go with an ACO type model, it would take somewhere in the realm of about 24 months to get something going. So my guess, if I had to read the tea leaves on this one, we'll kind of look for the legislature to, to give us a more concrete direction uh, as we go into the legislative session in a few weeks. Uh, as far as maternal health, I will say that we're looking at um, several options uh, and additional services around this. I'm uh, personally pushing the ideas of reimbursing for doulas through Sooner Care. We all know that there's a lot of research out there, especially when it comes to uh, promoting health equity across our population. Um, health equity, by the way, is a huge push for the Biden administration and CMS. And so we're gonna see a lot coming through a lot of our policies in the next uh, few years. Uh, we're currently, the way we do things is we submit a concept form, we start doing the research and uh, assess what budget impact there would be, and then do the legislative budget request, of course, with all that. But I would definitely want to lean on this group in terms of assistance with research and evidence-based practices as we start going down that path. Uh, we definitely see you as our partners and our uh, subject matter experts in this area. So we'd love to stay, stay connected as we go down that road. Uh, oh, postpartum extension. <clears throat> We've got a lot of requests around the new Biden um, uh, initiative to allow for extended postpartum care through 12 months instead of our current 60 days. I will say that we looked at this every way there was and since there is, since we did an expansion and our current FPL for pregnant women is the same as that of expansion, those women will go into the expansion population and there really doesn't have a need for the extended postpartum period. Now, after we did that, we ran some data and uh, we'll say this is a work in progress. <clears throat> I'm just kind of letting you know where we're at. When we ran some data, we saw that around 200 women would lose eligibility if we didn't extend the postpartum eligibility period. But when we look at reason codes for that, it's around lack of residency requirement, lack of or failure to update their income information. It's not necessarily that they went over the federal poverty limit that's allowed for the group. So we continue to do a deeper dive into that, see if it's really needed. Uh, honestly, in our opinion, if one woman will lose coverage, if we didn't do it, it's worth going ahead and applying for that waiver. Uh, so we are looking at that. It, it wouldn't be that uh, heavy of a lift for us to pursue that. So we're, we're considering that as well. But would love to hear any, um, any thoughts you all have around that, or uh, maybe I'm always open to say, maybe I'm missing something on that one. Maybe, maybe there is something there that I'm missing. Um, 
that's, I think that's all of it at a 30,000 foot view. If uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I, I think this, this John Stanley, I, I think for the postpartum extension, if there's some way that you can sort of put that into action and just, it sounds like it's going to happen anyhow, but if there's any way you can apply for the waiver and kind of just put it down, it, it will seem like something positive that we've accomplished going forward. And, and I mean, we need everything we can right now positive. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, now I will say that if you, in the Medicaid world, if you do a waiver, there's a lot of reporting that comes around it. And so if we were to add a population where, you know, we were doing it just maybe for a win, there'd be a lot of internal reporting. But again, like I said, even if there's one person, it's worth it, right? So we definitely want to look at it. Um, yeah. Like I said, not that huge of a lift to actually apply for and get it. It's more of that quarterly reporting that we have to do with budget neutrality calculations. But um, yeah, I agree. Trailer, I know. There are a lot of people in this group that would be willing to to help um, <laughs> and provide insight to um, OHCA's work and postpartum extension and um, providing reimbursement for doula services. We're really, that's something that this group um, definitely prioritizes. So please don't hesitate tape to reach out and we can ask about that but yes hey, but, uh, we've done quite a, uh, an extensive environmental scans of other states that have done this uh to me it doesn't seem like a big budget issue around it as far as terms of reimbursement goes um apparently now is the time of night where my dogs want to fight um <laughs> but i guess my main question would be around current workforce what does our current doula workforce look like in the state and are there clusters are they mostly metro areas and of course nothing we have to answer now but um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm not able to assess from a state level is how, how how we're currently set up to build out this infrastructure i think there are probably on some on this meeting who could help with that and would be happy to have a dis meeting with you about that as well Yes, trailer. Hannah Ralston here with Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative. I just messaged you, um, but we are very, we have doulas on staff and are uh, currently training cohorts of doulas. So would love to be involved in that conversation of what that could look like. Awesome. Also, I will go ahead and put my email address out in the chat too. So if you uh, are interested to reach out to me directly and I guess so we're in that concept form period internally where we're getting the conversation going. So I definitely I intend to set up working groups uh, moving forward. Trailer, this is Stephanie Pierce with OU Health. I just had one other thought on that. I think one really important um, aspect of improving maternal health is um, postpartum care, like we've been talking about. But I wonder if, um, you know, with doula support, if that's something that could be improved in terms of, you know, home visits and, um, you know, some closer postpartum follow-up, like I know, um, you know, is available in some, you know, more widely in some other countries that's really made a difference in terms of um, improving maternal health. I think too, what I will need kind of internally is um, helping explain it to the, the rest of my colleagues. Because I think there's a current misunderstanding on what a doula is, the value that they add to the system, um, and getting folks to understand that. Um, you know, I, I think there's this thought that they're all just unlicensed folks giving birth and helping give birth in people's homes, and they don't understand the value. So that would that would also be a huge help to me personally. Yeah, uh, we can certainly provide you with that information, um, Trailer. I know there are some other training opportunities in um, Oklahoma City as well. And there are probably some, there's some certification groups that, that could provide us with information. So if you are interested in working on this, please email trailer and maybe we can convene a meeting to talk about this um, trailer and, and move forward. But I agree, Stephanie, thanks for the, that great point about that is something that could be improved with the postpartum extension. Um, you know, currently with um, 
the way reimbursement works with the global reimbursement that providers are not motivated to um, provide more than one postpartum visit or even one really. So have, you know, ACOG recommends two and um, yeah, that could be as part of the global, but um, you know, it's, you can understand if, if providers are needing to do more postpartum visits, they would want to be reimbursed for that time. Um, but also providing the more extensive um, home visits, especially for those who are high risk, um, could be very helpful with our, because um, the majority of deaths take place in, and maternal morbidity and mortality both take place in the postpartum period. So um, we will certainly reach out. So email trailer and, and I'll work with you as well, trailer, and we can work on getting a group started Perfect. to help you with this. That's exciting news. Very good. Chad, right. I know that game, is that all your, all of your updates, trailer? Yeah, that's all I have. Okay, thank you so much for mm -hmm. sure, um, providing these updates tonight. And I know Becky Mantle wanted to provide a couple of updates. Becky, I know you requested to share your screen. Yeah. Um, Can you I want to go it? ahead and share? Yes. Okay, give me just one second here. Yeah, just a few minutes of um, time. Let me get my... There we go. Um, to just yeah, share a few, uh, hopefully also some, uh, well, very exciting <laughs> to follow trailers announcement. So, and we certainly, um, the Coalition of Oklahoma Breastfeeding Advocates, um, we have a lot of doulas that are members of that um, organization as well. And they come to a lot of breastfeeding training. So we would be very supportive and um, willing to help um, in whatever way possible. But just wanted to give a few um, quick updates. Um, so many of you are aware that we had um, our Senate Bill 469 um, that was making great progress um, last year and it passed out of Senate and House Appropriations, um, uh, passed out of the full Senate and then the House Appropriations and Budget Health um, Subcommittee. And then um, it, it kind of parked there and didn't get um, make any further progress. So, so it's, was just dormant over the summer and um, just really needs two more votes. So it will go um, to the full health um, house health committee and then the full house, hopefully fingers crossed that it does have strong bipartisan support. It passed overwhelmingly out of the Senate and the Senate author is Carrie Hicks, a Democrat out of Oklahoma city. And then um, Carol Bush is um, the, the house uh, co-author, a Republican out of Tulsa. So even, you know, statewide um, representation there too. So, so uh, stay tuned on that um, as we just need a couple more votes. And this will actually um, provide um, uh, Medicaid coverage of um, donor milk from our nonprofit milk banks, specifically for babies in the community, because that's the gap in coverage that we have in our state, um, where most babies in the NICU and in, in our hospitals are, you know, if, if they have a medical need, they're getting donor milk, but once they're discharged, or if there's a medical issue that comes up after hospital discharge, um, you know, there's no uh, coverage for those babies. Um, so, uh, of course, a, a, a bill that actually was um, filed last year, but not heard, and we just, yeah, we that let it kind of sit there and wait for a little more background work to be done. Um, uh, and this is actually incentivizing um, baby-friendly hospital designation with a small um, uh, percentage increase in reimbursement to our birthing hospitals that achieve baby-friendly designation. And um, once again, this has strong bipartisan support. Carrie Hicks, again, is the main author. And this, she said this will be her primary legislative focus um, this session. And the House um, co-author is Nicole Miller, a um, Republican out of um, uh, Edmond. And um, we've so far gotten um, verbal support from the Oklahoma Hospital Association, A1, um, Oklahoma ACOG, and working on other groups as well. And I had had a meeting um, uh, some a few weeks ago with Dr. Valentine, who's the Healthcare Authority's Chief Quality Officer, to update him um, and get feedback from him, and then um, sent and re um, honored his request to send a lot of um, what the evidence says about um, outcomes 
outcomes related to breastfeeding and baby friendly. So, um, so stay tuned um, that we hope that bill will make it through. Um, in the session this year. And then um, also an initiative that we've been working on, um, not a bill, <laughs> not a piece of legislation, but this is lactation support for incarcerated mothers. And um, once again, led by Senator Hicks, um, but in collaboration with the Department of Corrections, we did an interim study last fall and um, have had some very positive conversations with DOC and their leadership. And everyone really is in agreement um, that they want to do this. It's just working out logistics now. And this would um, start actually with um, any inmates that are in Mabel Bassett um, to be able to provide expressed milk um, to their babies. COBA actually has a $10,000 grant, thanks to um, the great work of our executive director, Heidi Russell, who's on the call today. Um, so we do have a, a grant to help launch this project. And, um, and then the Oklahoma Mother's Milk Bank will certainly um, help with uh, shipping of milk um, to um, the uh, caregivers of those babies. So we're very excited um, and stay tuned once again on that. And I will end with just a um, plea as we've heard from about the uh, uh, blood banking um, crisis. Well, we're having um, a, not exactly the same thing happening, but we are having for a variety of reasons a significantly increased demand for donor human milk across the country. So our nonprofit milk banks, you know, we're seeing a significant uh, increase in demand when of course, we're struggling with staffing and COVID and things like that as well. So just spread the word. Um, if you know of breastfeeding families that might have extra milk um, that would be willing to be a donor, um, just go to the okmilkbank.org website and help us um, you know, recruit uh, additional donors so we can keep that supply strong. And I will stop there and um, see if there's any questions. I'll stop sharing and give that back to you, Barbara. So, so yeah, if there's time, if anybody has any questions, um, happy to answer. Any questions for Becky or other updates? All right. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and provide a couple of updates for OPQIC in general. Um, we mentioned last week, you heard, I mean, last qu quarterly meeting back in October, we heard about team birth. So just wanted to let you know that our cohort one hospitals, we have nine hospitals in our first cohort and that are planning to launch in March. And they are working diligently, um, planning and preparing for their team birth launch. Uh, we're very thankful and we cannot express our gratitude to these hospitals for continuing to remaining, continuing to remain engaged and working hard on these things even during these times of such um, overwhelming um, capacity issues. So. Thank you to those hospitals. And we do have, as Joyce mentioned, some hospitals in line for cohort two. We will begin reaching out to other hospitals and those hospitals about um, preparing for team birth for our cohort two um, coming up. And we do, there was a recent publication about team birth and the initial pilot um, group of four hospitals, including our own St. Francis in Tulsa. And we do have two other hospitals in Tulsa that began implementation in March, OSU Medical Center and um, Hillcrest Medical Center. And the research, the data that, preliminary data that's coming out through those hospitals is very promising about the increase in patient feeling more of an impact with that they were involved in shared decision making and that the huddles that they were involved with of team birth had an impact on their care and their patient satisfaction scores are also increasing at those hospitals. So 
um, and providers. <laughs> We're doing a mid um, mid um, launch um, survey right now with providers and what their what their thoughts are about teen birth with the nurses and doctors and midwives that are involved as well. So be on the lookout and um, we will have more information on teen birth to follow. And also Sarah Johnson provided um, an update last meeting about our Empowering Pregnant and Postpartum Patients program. And our plan was to launch that right now in January. Uh, but we are going to uh, postpone that um, for obvious reasons. So you'll be hearing more about that as we come down, hopefully, as Dr. Smith mentioned, fairly soon. Um, we know we've got a hard few weeks ahead and um, hopefully uh, as we come down from the Omicron surge, uh, we can go, we will be able to reach out to hospitals about this. And this includes um, the post-birth warning signs that Joyce mentioned. It also includes um, providing information on urgent maternal warning signs during pregnancy and providing um, information to all mothers on regular usual issues that and questions that they might have and how to um, access um, credible sites for that information and also um, information, um, also providing a clinical summary to um, postpartum patients at their birth hospitalization. So that will be coming out soon, be on the lookout. I wanna to move to the next request here. Um, oh, this happened a couple of months ago, um, there is a perinatal listserv for nurses in Oklahoma, and one of our nurses reached out about um, asking other hospitals about the quote-unquote requirement that hospitals report all stillbirths to the medical examiner's office. Um, that caught our attention because I'd never heard of that being a requirement. Um, we did some investigation and looking at the statute also, and we're still trying to figure this out, but there seems to be um, a variety of um, throughout the state, and we know that some of the staff at the Oklahoma Medical Examiner's Office is um, telling hospitals that they are required to report all stillbirths and even miscarriages, no matter the gestational age, to the medical examiner's office. And there have been instances of um, those persons then coming in and wanting to retain custody of the remains or the body and um, disrupting the bereavement process in the hospital. And, this is causing a lot of distress, as you can imagine, for, for all involved. Um, we also heard from some hospitals that were also very unfamiliar with this um, request. So we know that um, there's a lot of variation in what's out there, and we have been trying to um, contact the chief medical examiner himself to uh, hopefully maybe provide a clarity on this. We have not been able to do so. Haven't been able to get a response from him. Wanted to hear from you guys if anybody has um, any more additional information or if you have any, um, any ways to help us access the chief medical examiner uh, besides direct emails and um, voicemails and leaving messages with his administrative assistant. So, and also reporting, um, requesting information from the legal counsel. Um, so I'm gonna open it up and you all um, free to discuss if you have any information or um, know of any way that could be helpful with this um, issue. Barbara, 
for thank you for that information. That's actually a little disconcerting in light of the recent litigation against um, women with miscarriages and, and charging them with the history of SUD with um, you know manslaughter. And I, I'm not sure. I, I am happy to dig into it and see statutorily um, what is authorized and, and provide you with that. We do because have that the first information. Thing that pops to mind with me is that for some purpose to try and perhaps charge the mothers with some kind of a crime, but I'm not sure. Yeah, thanks Jacqueline. We do have the statute and we believe that they're interpreting us as these, you know, as you said, um, if the um, remains or the infant or the mother test positive for any substance, then that's when they retain custody. And um, we think that that's perhaps how these um, district attorneys are learning of these cases. Um, you know, but it is, as you can understand, very disconcerting for the hospitals. Um, and yes, so yeah, we, we know that this is not happening throughout the state. It is only in certain areas. And um, we're, we're very concerned about this and want to ensure that there is a uniform response, a consistent um, interpretation of this statute that just because a pregnant person tests positive for substances and um, has a stillbirth or a miscarriage that it's not um, a it falls under the suspicious death um, category but we believe that is what's happening when did these cases start popping up that that we started hearing from them saying that we had to report this when did this start well we don't know how long it's been going on um yeah, perhaps for a while, but we heard about, we learned about it probably in late October, early November. Barb, this Lawana, uh, let's make a meeting with our legal counsel and our government relations people and have you talk to them and let help, let, let us help, you know, get involved with trying to help you solve that. Thanks, Lawana. We can certainly do that. So happy to to um, provide information i just just floored by that oh. yeah it's um very um from what the situations described to me at these hospitals it's been very, very traumatic for all involved so um we want to prevent those things from happening and i think um we, we do have um, information I'll, I'll let here in a minute um, provide some update, but we, we are looking into some anti-stigma training and, and we believe that you know, education could perhaps solve this. So um, we wanna look at that as well, so. Thanks, Luana. I'll reach out to you. And if anybody, anybody else has any comments, I know I've already spoken to a lot of you on this meeting about about this. But we thought this was a wider audience, so wanted to mm -hmm. um, share that with with others. So. And now let's transition as you guys. Um, we will recall we have a big, um, a lot of work going on throughout the state addressing substance use disorder and pregnancy. And uh, as a reminder, OMNO, Oklahoma Mothers and Newborns Affected by Opioids, is the work that is going on specifically with hospitals and um, perinatal clinicians, so those who care for, for mothers and newborns. Uh, that was launched um, first right before the pandemic started 
COVID. So um, really we had a reboot in September of last year. So we have 17 hospitals that are participating in this and Denise is gonna provide you. Um, this is our first pilot, our, our first cohort for this and Denise Cole will provide you with some information. I do wanna provide some information um, from the other bigger umbrella group. We heard a presentation last meeting about this, um, the Oklahoma Safer group um, trying to um, create more of a, a supportive rather than a, than a uh, punitive response for these people. So um, Denise, I can't remember, yeah. Just an update, and Teresa, I'm not sure if you're still on this call, on the meeting. Um, I'll provide a, I think, looks like Teresa. I am. How'd it go? Sorry. Oh, she's here. <laughs> Yay, hi, Teresa. So um, I just put a couple of things on here, and then, Teresa, perhaps you can can um, provide some more information. But we do, you all received information at the last meeting about the family care plans and that training will be available um, hopefully in mid to late March. And then, as I just mentioned, we do, we are investigating an anti-stigma campaign based on one that's in Colorado called Tough as a Mother. And this would be, <laughs> a, um, you know, a public awareness campaign and um, providing education. So uh, I have an email here if you'd like to be included in these Omno and Oklahoma Safer meetings. They, if you attend all of them, they are held monthly. And Teresa, I will, do you have anything to add um, with the updates? No, I mean, the family care plan um, is module. So it, it gives an overview of what that family care plan looks like. And then it has, the different modules showing you how to actually um, engage in developing a family care plan. It's not, um, sometimes people think of a plan as like a treatment plan or a medical plan, but this is more of a collaboration of resources and it does have, you know, planned out what they're going to be working on prior to delivery of the baby and after. Um, but it also includes all family members. It provides educational materials. And so it's really a wraparound um, model for the entire family. And, you know, just reminding everyone that, you know, it is scary what's happening with the legal system right now. And that's why we feel like this is even more imperative that we provide this type of resource prior to delivery so that we can really educate um, child welfare and the uh, the legal system on these individuals can be productive parents and they can be in recovery. And so um, having these family care plans in place to be able to take to the hospital has really shown to be such a, a great asset to not only the physicians, um, you know, delivery, in the in the hospital, but to um, the individual families, and then I think with that anti stigma campaign, it will help mothers feel comfortable or individuals feel comfortable coming to obtain services. I think there's such a fear that individuals will enter into the legal system or they will have their children um, removed that they even fear prenatal care. But if we can help with the anti stigma campaign and let them know that there's help out there with the family care plans, then we can actually reduce um, the impact of that. So that's that's all I wanna add to that, but it is, it's very sad and very scary for some of these individuals to think that they can't get services because of what might happen. Basically, that training will be open to anyone, Barbara. I just wanted to make sure. And it um, is a cost. Yeah, it's a. It's not a. It doesn't cost. It's free. It will be um, on our website, but we'll make sure that everyone has links to that, and it can be shared with that anyone that might be providing some kind of a resource or service to an um, individual that's pregnant. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, we're, that's exciting. So. A lot going on. I will transition now and let Denise and 
Barbara Coop provide our uh, update for Omno. I would like to go ahead and update uh, on two of the Omno partners that we're working with. The first one is the Department of Mental Health. Uh, they have an overdose prevention project that where they distribute free naloxone in hospitals to patients that are at risk of or experiencing an overdose. In November, we had a webinar held with all the pharmacists that are uh, associated with our Omno hospitals at this time. During that, we went over what they needed to do to participate, which basically comes down to signing an agreement. And then uh, ODMH SAS trains that hospital staff and they provide ongoing training and technical assistance. Uh, they distribute the naloxone kits to them. Uh, it's at this time, it's already in some of our EDs around the state, and they are connecting with hospitals through our Omno project, but it's not really intended just for maternity or OB departments. This is intended for all patients within the facility that are at risk of experiencing an overdose. Um, at this time, we have had two hospital systems and two individual hospitals have signed agreements and began training. And two other hospital systems are in the process of signing agreements. And the next one, uh, just a little update on Chess Health. Uh, Joyce mentioned this a minute ago, but um, for those of you that are not familiar, Chess Health is a digital health company that focuses on substance use disorders. They do, uh, you can do referral. They have a referral management platform where they get patients into treatment and then follow them through recovery. As Joyce mentioned, it's now open to all maternal health services in the state. Uh, you can see over here that uh, 17 of our Omno hospitals, we have 11 that are live with Chess Health referrals happening at this time. Three that have signed up and are pending training. They just haven't started their training yet. And three that are trying to get through the BAA process uh, through their hospitals. It's a really big network. They have 81 providers um, that are connected. They have 58, 56 of those are actually implementing at this time. Uh, we get into the e-recovery over here, which is their connection apps for the maternity patients. Uh, and then we have this new online community called Family Pregnancy Parenting and Beyond, and it provides other services. It has maternity specific content. So this is not just for moms that um, are associated with substance use disorder. This is maternity specific surveys, content. They have pre and postnatal discussion groups where those women can get in a discussion group and just talk about what's going on with them. So kind of um, a nice place for them to connect. And then uh, this past by uh, next week, I think it is, the OSU National Center for Wellness and Recovery which is another addiction recovery clinic, is going to be connected within S Health, which will be not for the hospitals in Tulsa. And that is all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Denise to talk about our data. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so we began with Omno collecting data in October. October of 2020. And for those of you who might not be familiar with our data collection process, um, what we did was we asked our participating hospitals, of which we currently have 17 in some form of participation, we asked them that any time that they care for a mother or a newborn who is affected by opioids, and we define that as the mother has either a positive self-report screen or some kind of history of opioid use disorder or chronic use of opioids. 
or if they discover that a newborn that's being cared for in their facility has tested positive um, with toxicology or exhibits withdrawal symptoms. So we have 17 hospitals that are currently submitting data. Um, we are now reporting on data that we have received for date of delivery or date of birth from July 1st to September 30th of 2021. So this is Q3 of 2021. During that period, we received 101 total records. Um, some of those records were duplicated from transfer from one hospital to another. Some of those records, um, the mothers do not necessarily have opioid use disorder. Um, so in that total set, we had 97 women with opioid use disorder. And that um, also represents 101 newborns because there were several multiples within that set. Of the newborns, 87 of them were greater than 35 weeks gestation. So that means that there were about 15 that were less than 35 weeks. We had 12 hospitals that were reporting that they had at least one case during that period, three hospitals that reported that they didn't have any cases, and then the other two hospitals did not submit data during this time. So we ask demographic information um, about the mother, and we do collect maternal um, zip code of residence. And this is kind of a, um, a map of the different zip codes that are represented in this data set. And I will also point out to you that um, the yellow circles that you see on the map are the cities that have a hospital that is participating. So we have participation um, going from the southwest corner up to the northeast. We have um, Duncan and Lawton, also participation from hospital in Norman, Oklahoma City, Yukon, the Tulsa area, and Bartlesville. And so some of our records are obviously going to come from hospitals that are from regions that are served by these hospitals. Um, but we are continuing to be um, surprised by how widespread we're seeing. When we initially were looking at um, zip code information, we were thinking that maybe it might inform us with some certain areas of um, heavy use or heavy indi indications or multiple cases of opioid use disorder. And what we're finding is that we really haven't been able to see any patterns of areas or hotspots of use. So for this particular period, we had the 97 mothers represented. There was a zip code entered for each of those mothers. And again, that's 12 hospitals. 71 of those zip codes were unique, meaning 71 different zip codes are represented um, within this data set. 51 um, were reported with only one record, and then 15 were reported with two records, and only five had more than two records reported in those areas. So that's what you're seeing here on the table, is that zip codes that are represented by more than two records. And we've been reporting it this way. Um, this was our fourth quarter to report. Um, and each time we have a different set of zip codes that's represented by multiple records. So again, that just emphasizes that there really is no trend that we're able to appreciate with location. Here is a zoom in on the map. Um, you can see the Tulsa metro area on the left and the Oklahoma City metro area there on the right. Looking at it by insurance status, we can see that the vast majority of the cases reported um, have mothers and newborns that are insured through our Medicaid or Sooner Care system. And then we have a little bit of breakdown. Um, private insurers is the next um, most common um, method of insurance, and then followed by um, other, which in some cases, um, Medicare is always sometimes reported as the other um, insurance to note. Breaking it down by race and ethnicity, um, we have 67% of moms and nearly 70% of babies um, are noted to be white or European descent, followed by uh, Native American and Alaskan Native and Black or African descent. And you can see that um, we do have, like our data set represents 97 moms and 101 total babies. Um, more, sometimes some cases have more than one race being reported for those babies.
We do ask about to toxicology and exposure to different substances, trying to um, identify what particular substances we're seeing the most of. This is our maternal and fetal exposure. There are three different bars for each substance. The darker gray bar um, is a indication that there was maternal history of use during the pregnancy. So it was either disclosed or um, we were aware during pregnancy that mom was taking that substance. So you can see that in that situation, buprenorphine was the most common um, substance that was disclosed with use or use was known, followed by cannabinoids. And then we look at prenatal maternal urine drug screen and maternal birth hospitalization urine drug screen. So that's the purple and the green bars. Hospitals can send a multiple variety of panels whenever they send a substance or a specimen for toxicology testing. Um, higher panels, you can get more specific with opioids. And in lower end panels, they might just lump opioids just in one category. So there is a little bit of variety among hospitals and how they report and analyze their toxicology. For the newborns, we ask if they had an umbilical cord segment or a meconium specimen or a urine specimen sent. And what we have found is that of the 87 opioid exposed newborns that are greater than 35 weeks gestation, 83 or 95% of them had an umbilical cord segment sent for testing. So that's by far um, the most commonly used um, specimen. Of those, 71 were positive for a substance. That is about 86% of the specimens that were sent. We did have um, two hospitals that reported sending a meconium sample. And then in 21 of our records, we had a urine sample sent. One thing that we, um, there's multiple interventions that are recommending with this project, but at the very beginning, we want to help to identify mothers um, who might need services or treatment related to opioid use disorder, because identifying is our, the first step of, um, along our pathway for intervention and treatment. And so we ask the hospitals of the different prenatal care sites that are associated with their hospital, which person or what percentage of them are doing some kind of a screening universally, um, not necessarily testing, but screening through some kind of a, a tool to help identify those mothers. And so in Q4 of 2020, that was our first quarter of data to collect, um, the hospitals were reporting that 52% of the prenatal care sites were um, implementing a universal screening policy, and that has increased every quarter. So this most recent quarter, Q3, we had 79% um, were reported to have a universal screening policy. So what we're hoping to see is that as we continue to um, improve our identification and continue to use our interventions such as chest health, that we can begin to see more of an increase of um, getting women engaged in treatment, either through medication assisted treatment or through behavioral health treatment or both. Uh, what we're seeing is um, that we don't really have a good trend to appreciate. In quarter three, we had 48 of those 97 mothers where it was indicated um, that they had been engaged in MAT or behavioral health treatment during pregnancy. So that's only 49% of the women that were reported. On this particular um, slide, you're gonna see that the, the bar on the graph on the left um, has um, 12 bars. And so each of those bars represents one of the reporting hospitals for this period. You can see there the number on top is the number of women that they indicated um, had received MAT or behavioral health treatment during pregnancy. And then the percentage is the percentage of the women that they served during this period or the, the cases that they reported during this period. So we do have wide variety um, of percentages um, among the hospitals. And then the green line on the right indicates our collaborative wide rate. We 
We also ask about um, certain testing that was performed and other interventions that were performed with mother during pregnancy. And one of those that we continue to watch is the number of women who um, were tested for hepatitis C during pregnancy. We haven't had a lot of movement um, with this particular measure. So in quarter three, we had 58 of the 97 um, women, and that's about 60% of the women with OUD who were tested for HCV during pregnancy. And I'll let Barbara Coop kind of pipe up and tell us about ACOG's recommendation on hepatitis C screening. Yeah, in May of 2021, um, ACOG came out with a new practice advisory in screening uh, in pregnant individuals. And this is just a little excerpt of that advisory uh, on hep screening. But because of the increase in infections in women of reproductive age and the implications for perinatal transmission, the CDC recommended that we include screening for pregnant individuals during each pregnancy. ACOG is updating this hepatitis screening guideline to recommend screening for all pregnant individuals during each pregnancy um, so that the uh, pediatrician, there's not any treatment for pregnant women with hep C in pregnancy, but this is so that the pediatric pediatricians can be informed to follow those infants and find out who needs to receive testing at their pediatric visits because about 6% of these infants will develop hep C. One of the reasons I think that we're seeing such a low level of screening for this is it may be an awareness issue, but I think it's more likely that when a woman comes in and is having her prenatal labs run, they're ordering routine prenatal labs, but most don't include a hep C testing. So at this time, that has to be a written in add-on test for most labs that we send to. I know there are a couple of hospital labs here in town that have added this into their prenatal profile, but not that many. So this is just where providers and their staff need to be very cognizant of this and add the hepatitis C that, uh, testing in on this. And Barbara, it's Stephanie Pierce. I just wanted to add to, um, you know, in addition to the hep C being important for the pediatricians, it's also just as important for um, the patient for the mom to know if she has hep C because then there are really effective treatments that she can get postpartum. Um, sure. And, if, you know, during her prenatal care, that's a good window of time to, um, to let her know that and to help her get established with, you know, a GI doctor or a, a internal medicine doctor who can treat her in the postpartum time. Yeah. Make sure that that occurs before the next pregnancy. Moving into some of our newborn measures, um, one thing we track is the percentage of those newborns who are exposed to opioids um, that actually go on to require pharmacologic therapy. During this period, we had four hospitals that provided pharmacologic treatment to their newborns. And in total, we had 30 newborns or 34% of our OENs greater than 35 weeks that required a pharmacologic therapy. So again, the graph on the left, um, we have one bar representing um, each of our hospitals. And then the graph on the right is our collaborative wide trend um, for the last year. Of those newborns who did require pharmacologic treatment, um, for those four hospitals, um, we have their average length of treatment, which for the entire collaborative ended up being 13.48 days. And length of treatment also ties into overall length of stay. There are a lot of different ways that we can break down uh, the length of stay for these newborns. And what we have done is we have taken those 87 that were greater than 35 weeks. We also ask a question on our data form. Um, did they have a medical indication that might have increased their length of stay? And if 
they answered yes to that question, then we have omitted them from um, comparing them to other newborns um, regarding length of stay. So what we do is we compare um, all of our opioid exposed newborns who were, did not have a medical indication for increased length of stay, and that ends up being 63 for this data set. Two of those, 31 of them had some kind of um, withdrawal symptom or could be classified as having neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS. So we compared those that the green line here with the bars on the left are, um, again, each set represents a hospital. And the green line is the average length of stay for all of their opioid exposed newborns. And the purple line indicates their length of stay for those that had withdrawal symptoms or NAS. And I went ahead and added an indicator for the four hospitals that were providing pharmacologic treatment. And as you can imagine, those that had babies that require treatment ended up having a longer length of stay. So collaborative-wide, babies that were having um, withdrawal had an average of 12.5 um, days in the hospital, and all opioid-exposed newborns had an average of 7.9 days. Our next couple of slides go over um, the hospital's involvement in reporting um, to DHS. And so I wanted to throw this in to remind everyone of what our current statute is. Um, so this is um, our current Oklahoma statute, the duty to report. And in that, it indicates that every physician, surgeon, or other healthcare professional, including doctors of medicine, licensed osteopathic physicians, residents and interns, or any other healthcare professional or midwife involved in the prenatal care of expectant mothers, or the delivery or care of infants shall promptly report to the department instances in which an infant tests positive for alcohol or a controlled dangerous substance. And this should include infants who are diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And I just wanted to remind that because we continue to um, see as we're analyzing our data um, that there is still misconception out there about what the statute is. Um, and when a baby should be reported and when they are not. Um, so we continue to ask the question, was the baby reported to DHS? And you can see here, each of these bars represents one of our reporting hospitals. The orange portion of the bar represents that yes, this baby was reported. Blue is no. And then the gray is either unknown or they left that particular question in blank. So we had a couple of those during this reporting period. But as you can see here, we have variation among our hospitals. In total, um, 69 out of the 87 um, or 79 percent were reported to DHS. And we had a total of um, 18 that were either no or unknown. And in our forms, whenever somebody indicates that a DHS report was not made, then they're prompted to give a reason for that. And so this is a breakdown of some of the reasons that we received. Um, again, we had 16 no responses. Um, and of those 16 no responses um, for toxicology, we had 10 of those um, babies that tested positive for opioids. And in one case, it was opioids and barbiturates together. We had two of those babies that were positive for cannabinoids only, one that was tested, but the results came back negative, one that was not tested, and then two that we don't have any of the data from. So of those um, that we were given a reason, one of the cases was because it was a planned adoption. Um, so a report and their estimation was not necessary. We had four cases um, where the hospital reported that the mother was taking prescribed opioids for a medical reason. And so therefore they did not understand that the baby would need to be reported in that situation. All of those babies had a positive toxicology for opioids, but none of them experienced any withdrawal symptoms. In one case, um, a hospital said that they had told mom that they would only report if the toxicology came back positive. In that particular case though, the baby did have negative toxicology. It was an umbilical cord segment that was sent, but the baby required pharmacologic treatment for their withdrawal symptoms. Nine cases where the data reporter said they did not know why DHS was not contacted or it was blank. 
And of those, we had one baby that had withdrawal symptoms. Um, and but the toxicology was positive only for cannabinoids. And then we had one um, report that they were waiting for pending cord results. I'm assuming that meant that at the time of discharge, they did not yet have the cord results back, um, but they did report that the baby had a toxicology positive for buprenorphine. So not only do we ask about was baby reported to DHS, but we also ask if baby was placed in DHS custody in some form, whether it be physical custody or legal custody. And so this is our trend line starting from October of 2020 and ending with September of 2021. So we have 12 months worth of data represented here. So you can see the top line, the orange um, line is the percentage of OENs during that period that were reported to DHS. And then the blue line is those that were placed in DHS custody. In some months, um, we actually see somewhat of an inverse correlation. Um, I would have assumed that maybe we would see that the more that are reported, the more that are in custody. But we haven't really been able to appreciate a trend that um, actually proves or correlates with that. And then separately, we ask, did the newborn go home with biological mother? And this is either to the home where the mother resides or if they were happened to be discharged with mother to some kind of a treatment facility. And so you can see here, we do continue to have variation among the hospitals. Again, each of those um, bars on the left-sided graph represents a reporting hospital. And then our collaborative wide um, trend is on the right. In Q3, we saw that 55 of the 87 babies went home with biologic mom, and that's 63%. And lastly, we ask about um, early intervention and appropriate follow-up at discharge. Um, we ask if the infant was referred to an early intervention um, agency, such as Sooner Start. And what we're seeing is that we have a low rate of reporting of making appointments for early intervention. And part of that we're understanding has to do with the way that Sooner Start does their intake, that they don't actually um, want to receive the appointments prior to discharge of, from the birth hospitalization. And so kind of working with that behind the scenes to try to see how we can make sure that the hospitals have the ability to not only initiate a referral, but also have some follow-up um, um, if the referral actually um, goes through and if an appointment is actually made. So in this quarter, we had 25 um, infants that that were referred to early intervention. So that's only 29%. And of that 25, only one newborn said that, or one case indicated that the newborn had an appointment documented on the record. So again, this may be more of a process issue, not necessarily the willingness of the hospitals to refer, but in their ability to actually make the appointments. And that's the last of the data slides that I am going to present. So I'll pause here and ask if anybody has any questions. We do have more data points that we are reporting on. Um, this week we'll be sending out our aggregate reports to participating facilities. Um, so each hospital that has submitted data will not only receive the aggregate report, but they also will receive an individualized hospital report that compares and identifies where their hospital is on those bar graphs so they can compare themselves to the rest of the collaborative. Thanks. Thanks, Anish. Yeah, we, um, Tommy Yap, who is a research and policy coordinator with the Take Control Initiative, is going to present about the Metriarch Collaborative. As you can see here, it is a data haven for Oklahoma women, is how it is described. And we thought that you all here in this call might be very interested in um, all of the things that that you can get from Metriarch, including lots of data. So I think, Tommy, um, I'll let you take it away and you are going to share your slides. Can we all see that? Yes. Awesome. Okay, cool. 
Uh, my name is Tommy. Um, I'm with the Metriarch Collaborative. So just in case you haven't heard of us, um, Metriarch is a women's health data and policy collaborative comprised of more than 30 organizations in Oklahoma, including uh, OPQIC. Uh, it's about three years old and currently incubated under Take Control Initiative. Uh, we work to support our partner organizations with women's health data, policy, and research, as well as break down difficult concepts for all Oklahomans. At metriarchok.org, our website, uh, you'll be able to access data stories and the lookbook, which are data breakdowns that add context to compelling issues. You'll also be able to find op-eds relating to current events, policy papers that pick apart and explain the proposals, and a legislative tracker with bill summaries that are updated daily, which I'm going to discuss a little further. Uh, oops. There we go. Uh, this is just, you know, our current support team. Um, again, my name is Tommy, Research Policy Coordinator. Jacqueline Blocker is also on the call. She is the Data and Policy Director. We also have uh, Jenna Chapman and Grace Poulos. Um, this is a little bit of what I'm going to talk about, uh, just kind of give a brief overview of how biblical bill becomes law, the concept of carryover, bills from last year, bills from this year, and then some trends to watch as the policy, as the legislature starts. Um, I do want to give like kind of like the ethos of Metriarch. We believe in whole women's health, so that includes both bodily health and the social determinants of health, so from breastfeeding to economic mobility. Um, the bill passing process, I just like to give an overview of how a bill becomes a law because in Oklahoma there really isn't some civics of education and how this is discussed and it is different state to state if you learned it somewhere else. Um, this is going to be an abridged version. If you want a more in-depth version, you can go to our YouTube and I'll feature the link a little later, um, which uh, there are videos that really go into the topic. Uh, so this is our legendary bill tracker. It's fun. It's pink. It's very easy to read. Uh, first, you'll notice that there are two sides on each tracker and they're identical. That's because um, the Oklahoma legislature is bicameral. So there's a House and a Senate and a bill has to go through both before it goes to the governor. Um, we're going to do this thing on the Senate, but if it was the House, it would be basically the same process. Um, this is actually the step we're at now as we speak, or as, as we're here in this moment. Uh, we're at the introduction phase. Bills are introduced, and this is where bills um, kind of uh, are submitted with text akin to legislation. Um, and on January 20th, which is in two days, all of the bills must be submitted to be uh, considered. Um, moving forward, almost all the bills are, are assigned to a committee. Um, however, they're assigned and eligible, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get a hearing. Um, so if a bill doesn't end up getting a hearing, it doesn't move forward and kind of just gets stuck. Uh, a committee chairs are the ones who set the agenda for bills. Uh, this is partially due to time management because dozens of bills go to committee and there is a deadline in which bills need to leave committee to keep moving forward. Um, bills that are heard are given a pass-fail vote, and uh, the bills that are passed, so given a pass vote, are moved on to the next square of the tracker. Uh, bills at this point can also be altered, so this would be with a committee substitute or with a substitute or an amendment. A substitute would strip a bill of its language, put in new language, an amendment would uh, just alter the language that's already there. Um, this step begins when session begins, which will be on February 7th. Um, these dates come up real fast. <laughs> Take it from me. Um, so bills that pass committee are then eligible to be heard on the floor. And again, eligibility doesn't guarantee a vote. Um, and this is when the full chamber can make edits and then vote on a bill to keep it going. If a bill, oops, I'm freaking to advance. Okay. If a bill um, is passed the full chamber, then it is considered engrossed, which just essentially means done with this house and it's shipped over to the other chamber. So identical bills have to uh, pass both houses to be sent to the governor. Um, this leaves three options for a bill to keep going forward. So uh, again, starting in the Senate, the House could simply pass the Senate version, um, which would mean no changes straight to the governor. The House could make changes and the Senate would then vote to pass those changes, kind of like passing the bill a second time, then sent to the governor or the bill could be sent to conference committee, this thing in the middle, where the two chambers hash out the differences and craft a compromise bill, which would then need to pass both chambers to be sent to the governor. Um, once an identical bill has been passed, it's considered enrolled, which means done with both houses. 
And then it is sent to the governor who says, yes, it can become a law or vetoes it and no, it cannot become a law. Um, the final action in this whole process is that a legislature can override a veto and uh, which would essentially re uh, reverse the decision and that would require a supermajority vote. I went over that pretty quickly. That is a very abridged version. Like I said, if you want to jump into it more, um, a more in-depth version is available on our YouTube. So, so some key dates I just want to point out and highlight. Um, today is January 18th. January 20th is when bill introduction deadline. February 1st is when we're launching our bill tracker and February 7th is when session opens. And the reason I'm featuring them is because within the next two days, hundreds of bills are going to drop, like hundreds, because legislators are procrastinators. So they wait until the very last second to submit their bills. Um, I'm only able to kind of go over what I've seen so far. And like I said, hundreds more are gonna drop and I kind of tailor these presentations to the group that I am giving it to. So there could be more that pertain to this group. But again, this is these are the ones I've just seen. Um, and between the 20th and the first is when we identify bills to track as like our, our priority one. Um, so the bills I might feature now may not be on our tracker bringing them to your attention, but just know we do uh, track stuff on the back end that may not be on the tracker itself. So you could always contact us and we'll give you more information and an update. I do have to explain this concept of carryover. Becky, you went over it a little bit. I'm just gonna just make, just kind of give the definition of it. So um, currently the 58th legislature is serving in Oklahoma City. Legislatures are considered two-year bodies, so the representatives that passed bills in 2021 are the same that will be passing bills in 2022. Carryover is the mechanism that allows bills uh, from the first session, 2021, to be picked up and just continue where they left off in the second session, 2022. Only the bills that get stuck are the ones that carry over. Bills that were explicitly voted down, um, they would need to be reintroduced if a legislator wanted that to be reconsidered. Um, speaking of carryover, let's look at those carryover bills, starting with an MMRC bill. Uh, so this bill is SB 849. Uh, it would require the MMRC to compile a formal report and give that report to the chairs of the House and Senate Health Committees. Uh, Senator Joanna Dossett is the one who, uh, who authored this bill last session. She has indicated she is going to pick it up and run with it this session as well. Um, there is no clear indication if the chair, Senator Pugh, will schedule a hearing on the bill, but at least we know that it's going to be kind of picked up to keep going forward. Um, Becky went over this one, so I'm just going to kind of just briefly go over this one. Um, and I just wanted to add that Senator Hicks is very excited about this bill. I spoke with her and she was like all jazzed. And one of the things that she is kind of hopeful for is the reason it got stuck in the House uh, after passing the Senate is because it had a really big uh, fiscal impact analysis. So they were evaluating that it cost a lot. Uh, Senator Hicks's team has worked over the summer to kind of address that and say, no, 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 no. That fiscal impact analysis was incorrect. It was too inflated. Here's Here's the true fiscal impact analysis. So again, she is going to pick this one up and she has a lot of hopes for this because as Becky mentioned, it has actually a lot of bipartisan support behind it. Moving into 2022, oops. Okay, so um, there are, there's two bills so far that handle the OHCA board composition. Full disclosure, both of these bills are reactionary to uh, the actions Governor Stitt took in removing the physicians from that board. So both of these bills add physicians um, statutorily to the board. Um, HSB 1158 is a simple one, adds two new seats, one must be an MD and one must be a DO. Uh, HB 2971 has more meat to it or more bite, I guess you could say. Um, it just says that the qualifications of members must be a physician, stakeholders, and non-affiliated members. It also says me uh, board the board members cannot be at will, so they have to have a reason to be removed. And it would actually increase the role of the board over selecting the administrator. The governor would not be allowed to would not be able to just select someone. They would only be able to select someone from a pool the board creates. Uh, expansion of practice uh, would, in reference to midwives. 
Uh, so this would allow certified nurse midwives to practice independently under the supervision of a physician. Uh, this could possibly expand more access to uh, pregnancy care, and this could also expand, possibly expand access to um, midwives themselves uh, because it just lets them practice a little more independently. Um, expansion of practice in reference to pharmacists. So there are two bills, uh, SB1221 allows pharmacists to manage medications of patients after receiving a diagnosis from physician. Uh, so this would not gi uh, give physician, uh, sorry, pharmacists the ability to diagnose and provide diagnostics and uh, necessarily start care. They would just be allowed to be um, uh, medication managers. It explicitly says, for instance, in the bill, mental health medication, um, pain medication. So uh, the other one is uh, HB1215. It, it would allow pharmacists to prescribe non-prescription medications as well. So that would be uh, OTC medications. Um, vaccines, speaking about reactionary, these bills are reactions to um, discussions about employer mandates. The four that I pulled are all employer mandate related. Uh, I wanted to highlight HB 2978, that one specifically bans mandates in hospitals, um, but HB 2580 looks like it has the most weight right now because it's kind of like an all-encompassing omnibus, no discrimination based on vaccine status bill. It just covers all the bills that have been um, introduced into one. And that one has uh, leadership weight behind it because it's already been assigned a committee, which shows that they have interest in that bill this early on in the game. Uh, some trends to look at. Uh, first of all, $11 billion is coming to Oklahoma in federal funds. This is from all the fund, all, all the bills that have passed uh, the federal government recently within the last year, $11 billion of it is coming to Oklahoma and it needs to be spent. Uh, and it's going to be spent mostly by the legislature. So watch what they're doing. Um, keep an eye out. Contact your legislators if you know you have any particular projects you want pushed through because there's $11 billion to go around and that doesn't include the money going to tribal governments either. That's just the state, that's just county, and that's just city governments. The leadership has also begun uh, talking about tax cuts. So there is some strife in the leadership over whether that will go through or not, but there is interest in cutting taxes. Uh, the there's also been some indication outside coming out of the Capitol that they don't want to consider bills that cost money. That's going to be interesting because lots of things cost money. Lots of things the government does cost money and they, they've kind of indicated they don't want to address those this year, but that could be a positive when we're looking at these bills that deal with board compositions and MMRC report because those don't cost money. They are just compositional and uh, relating to the boards. Um, as I mentioned with the vaccines, COVID-19, uh, lots of reactionary bills to those. Um, I just highlighted the employer mandate one. There's others that deal with education, mask mandates, et cetera. So COVID-19 related bills are a big one. And then I think the elephant in the room, the biggest one of them all is this is an election year. Uh, when you have an election year, um, legislators and the executive politicians pass things that excite voters. It gets them to the polls. So watch for that kind of stuff. This is our social media. Um, you can find us on the platforms listed below uh, with the handle Metriarch OK. Um, or you can just go to metriarchok.org slash social and that'll give you all the links. On Twitter, we're going to be kind of like live updating what's going on in the legislature. Uh, with YouTube, we have those deeper dives into topics. TikTok, our weekly roundups of what's gone on in the legislature over the past week. And then Facebook and Instagram is going to be a nice mix between our data type stuff and our legislative type stuff. Uh, we also have um, clearinghouse calls. Uh, which are weekly policy information exchanges. Um, those are a lot of syllables to just say it's stakeholder policy stakeholders coming together to discuss what we're all doing in the policy realm when it comes to legislative session. You can contact me or Jacqueline if you are interested in joining those calls. They are open to all of our partners. Um, they are Fridays at noon starting February 11th. So um, it's the Friday right after session starts. I am open to questions. Um, my information is on the bottom. So um, like I said, 
If you have questions about these bills and we're not tracking them, like on our on our the tracker on the website, you can contact me. Um, if you have questions about other bills, uh, also you can get in touch um, or topic specific list of bills. I'm here for uh, Metro Partners to give as much information as I can. Um, but that's me, Tommy App. That's my email, and that is our website. Thank you. Wow! Thanks so much, Tommy. That was great. Um, I knew that uh, this group, this was very timely since we have our legislative session that's going to start here in less than a month. So we thank you so much, Tommy. And I will open this up. I would, I would encourage you all to visit their website. Um, there's lots of other things besides just the legislative piece. So um, please visit the, the Metriarch website and follow them on social media, get engaged in, and um, they're a wonderful partner for us. So uh, thanks again, Tommy. Any questions or discussion for Tommy? And Jacqueline is also on, who is the, um, Jacqueline, I don't know your official title, Executive Director, Director, CEO. Oh, not the Director of Data and Policy. Um, okay. So, yes. Thank you so much for including us, Barbara, and great job, Tommy. And I'm going to drop the link to the Friday uh, clearinghouse calls in the chat. And so, like I said, that's open. We do it every Friday at noon for an update. Uh, the legislative view, Tommy, will keep you up to date <laughs> on bills related to women's health. And we love feedback from our partners about other bills that you all are watching as well. Um, I would also uh, say that we uh, we take pretty detailed notes after those meetings. So um, I would suggest uh, just at least maybe getting on the mailing list if you can't make it just to be able to get the notes. Barbara, this is Becky. Um, just to comment um, a little bit more. Um, thanks, uh, Tommy, for sharing uh, about the uh, uh, Senate Bill 469, and and you're right. Um, uh, and so, just my uh, uh, about the um, fiscal impact statement. So, just kind of a a note to everyone that if there's a bill that's going through that does have some cost, potential cost, even if it's you know going to ultimately result in savings, they don't figure any kind of return on investment in their fiscal impact. They just look at the upfront what they estimate the fiscal cost. And if you have any knowledge about a particular uh, subject, um, definitely reach out to help make sure that that's an accurate fiscal statement, um, because we were working to come up with a good estimate for the donor milk bill and getting data from the Human Milk Banking Association of North America. And before we had even completed that, some you know estimate had gone to the Senate committee that was wildly inaccurate. And they had estimated actually that if we pass this bill for these small number of well, they calculated it would be thousands and thousands of babies, and it would cost more than all of the donor milk that was dispensed the previous year in the entire country. So, um, so <laughs> finding out that, no, 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 no. So we got that definitely revised down, but um, of course that um, delayed getting the bill um, voted again that last time, so. Questions for Tommy, feel free to reach out. Yeah. <clears throat> and thank you, Tommy. That's great information. And it's nice to have all that information collated in one location. There's so many things going on. And I think it's that's the biggest challenge to the point that you made you made earlier is that, you know, this really kind of goes slow at the start and then it gets hot and heavy in terms of everything's kind of a rush at the end. And you know, unfortunately I would I would say in, in past experience, that's kind of an opportunity for some more nefarious type of bills to get passed. And so it, it's helpful to have the vigilance that you've set to it. So thank you for the, the great work by you and your team. Okay, so um, the next on our agenda is just some dates to be aware of. Um, we've listed the future meeting dates that you can put those on your calendars. Obviously, there'll, there'll be emails that come out in advance um, asking you to register. They'll provide more of the details, um, but for those that like to plan way in advance, 
Um, there are the dates for the remainder of the, the year. And then as well as um, other upcoming events uh, for you to be aware of, uh, January 20th is the Omno Data Discussion. Um, February 23rd is the Amplified Tulsa, Unlocking Hidden, hidden Bias, How Our Unrecognized Attitudes Impact How We Treat Others. Then the following day on the 24th is the OMM, OMMB COBA Second Annual Pinwa and Pints for Premies. That's a mouthful. Say that fast a couple of times. And then February 25th is the OBRC 10th Annual um, Baby um, Becoming Baby Friendly in Oklahoma Summit. Um, so I'd like for you to be aware of those dates. Um, as always, you can go to our website, opqic.org under um, upcoming events and you can register um, for those in advance. I think before, I think that, before we yeah. move on, um, Becky had her hand raised. Did you have a question, Becky? Yeah, um, before you uh, wrap up, I just had um, one more um, end on a very positive note, exciting announcement. We just got news late today that um, Duncan Regional Hospital has been awarded um, baby friendly designation. So kudos to them. And um, I don't have the new percentage yet on the percent of babies born, but I know uh, certainly our, our percentage will increase. So we will we will sustain our rate that is higher than the national average for babies born in baby friendly hospitals. So stay tuned on more details on that. Good news. Congratulations. That's great. Thank yeah. you. you. That's and congrats to April Smith and all her Duncan yeah. uh, team and a lot of lot of work and then getting that done during the pandemic. So yeah, that's, that's the hard part. They're also in Omno Hospital, so um, that's a lot of work. I I do want to mention the slide too. Uh, that's that we're seeing. We Joyce mentioned the Speak Up training, and um, this is some information about that. Uh, you can go to our website to access the Speak Up training modules um, related to ra racial disparity, health equity, and birth equity. Any other, anyone else have any questions, comments before we adjourn? Here's our future meeting dates. So if you want to receive these emails um, alerting you when registration is open, um, you can well you can go here to register. Let me know if you you want you want to become a part of the OPQIC email list. Probably all of you are already. If you're not, um, email and we can add you to that list. And don't forget to follow us also on social media. And here are our contact, here's our contact information. So thank you all. And I hope um, we will be thinking of all the frontline providers as we're hit with these um, next couple of weeks are gonna be very um, challenging. So we, um, Again, we want to express our gratitude to all of you.